the anatomy of the ventricles, uh, of the ventricles. Just want to remember you for some key facts. First fact of all is that the form of the ventricles is dictated by the upfolding, by the cervical flexures, by the um, elongation of the cranial uh, part of the neural tube with the cervical flexure and the cranial flexure. Originally it was just like a neural tube with a white uh, lumen and a very small shell of neuroectroderm outside. The tube itself was filled already with liquor at early times that was already necessary for the, for the nourishment of the neuroectoderm. Later on, blood vessels will take over and the liquor itself, the CSF, has no longer any nutritive function. Perhaps for the ependyma, but most of the nourishment is done exclusively by the blood vessels. So then the hemispheral rotation dictates the form of the ventricles that we find later on. In the uh, spinal canal, it's still just a small, narrow spinal um, or remnants of the neural tube, whereas the rotation of the hemispheres dictates then the uh, partition of the a neural group into the uh, ventricles in the forebrain, mainly the lateral ventricles, into the midbrain, the third ventricle, into the hindbrain, the fourth ventricle. So on this uh, horizontal section that, for instance, here in the lateral ventricle with the anterior horn and posterior horn, we find significant compressions, significant compressions by the basal ganglia here, by the head of the nucleus caudatus, and by the internal capsule with the anterior ganu and the posterior ganu. And also in the frontal section, we see the narrowing of that original neural tube by the caudat nucleus. So the ventricle cast shows us in detail how the compression was formed and here we can also with the anterior horn and the inferior horn, the posterior horn, we can imagine that rotation towards the front, towards the back. Compression also in the third ventricle visible here by the interthalamic uh, adhesion and also as a result of that hemisphere rotation we see that the insula is transferred to the midline and overwhelmed by the temporal and frontal part. We have some recesses, the supraoptical recess and the, in, and the infundibular recess. On the back side, we have, a, have as a landmark the suprapineal recess and the pineal recess. And then we have sometimes an indentation here that's indicative for the marking of the hypothalamic area. That's the, the linear here, the hypothalamic area from the thalamic area. Then the connection of the aqueduct towards the fourth ventricle. When we go down to the fourth ventricle, we see that we have the, the medial, the unpaired median aperture and the lateral aperture that brings the connection from the internal liquor space to the external liquor space. We'll show that later on. The internal liquor space uh, contains about a third of the total contents between 30 and 40 milliliters. The total amount resting remaining two-thirds are in the external subarachnoidal space and that has a certain reason. The reason is of course that we need to get buoyance of uh, the brain. Otherwise that soft tissue of the brain, if we didn't have these external liquor spaces, our brain or the basal parts of the brain would suffer like a decubitic ulcer. But by the liquor, the mass of 1.3 to 1.5 kilograms is reduced to an effective weight of only 50 to 40 to 50 grams. So the, it's swimming the brain in that liquor, just like the embryo is swimming in the amniotic cavity in the uterus. Imagine if you didn't have that amniotic cavity in the uterus, if you didn't have the amniotic fluid, then the embryo would be, or the fetus would be compressed immediately with each cuffing or each uh, intra-abdominal pressure rise. That's why it's protected, that's why we can see it. By the way, when you look into embryology, it's quite interesting in all these conditions when you have a hydramnion, if you have an oligohydramnion, then there is a compression and the first organ where you see the reason for the oligohydramnion is the kidney, of course, because the kidney doesn't produce enough urine, so there's not, not enough amnion. Amniotic fluid is urine, but the, the organ where it's visible is then the lung because the lung doesn't have enough space to expand because there is too much compression. So it's evident in ultrasound first, the hypoplastic lung, and then secondary, you think about it, oh yeah, the reason is a missing kidney or a hypoplasia of the kidney, just like in the Potter syndrome. So buoyance of um, brain by the cerebrospinal fluid. It's made possible because we have the uh, choroid plexus. The choroid plexus is mainly found in the uh, lateral ventricles and in parts of the third ventricle and down to the fourth ventricle. 
It's attached to this plexus by the tenia fornices. With the, along the tenia fornices, we find a plexus, and the plexus is attached there. Uh, we can rip it off, and then we can see the tenia formation itself. Basically, it's a, a convolute of vessels, of blood vessels, that are lined by a cuboid epithelium. And that's an original section, that's the drawing. So we see that the cuboidal epithelium has a brush border on top of it. The brush border on top of it is for resorption and also for secretion. And then it's underlaid by the blood vessels, only a small subepithelial layer that's going behind that brings up the cerebrospinal fluid. Basically, when we compare the stuff, uh, serum and cerebrospinal fluid, then we see that it's much more than a simple ultrafiltrate of the serum. Um, but I don't go now on this. Well, the subarachnoidal space in these areas where the brain itself shows discrepancies, um, not a congruence between the frontal, medial, and uh, posterior skull base uh, groove, everywhere where we find some discrepancies between the outer brain and the skull, there we find the cisterns, just like the interpeduncular cistern or the uh, cisterna magna. So cisterns are nothing else than elongations of the basal part. So where does the liquor go to? Uh, before we start some showing of that, it's resorbed or drained by the arachnoid granulations. These arachnoid granulations are found next to the superior sinus, along the superior sinus, direct connections of subarachnoidal space to the veins, corresponding veins, but that attributes for about 80% of the drainage, about 20% of the drainage is going down into the spinal canal and then we have a peridural drainage where veins are connected to the endoneural spines and let, sooner or later we get into the internal venous vertebral plexus which is connected to the external venous vertebral plexus. Then we have as a third possibility just an efflux via the dura pouches along the endo or perineural tissue, that's the perineural tissue which is accounting for a little bit less for that. One last fact that we should mention here in that context is uh, that the blood-brain barrier is differently constructed in the areas where we have the liquor formation. In the area where we have next to the ventricles, uh, where it's uh, covered with ependymal cells, there we see that uh, between the epidermal cells there isn't transport from inside to outside. But it's not possible to make a transport of highly molecular stuff from the inside of the vessels that are subjacent here because they are connected, the endothelial cells, with tight junctions. So tight junctions make it completely closed, so we have an effective uh, blood-brain barrier. Here, in that case, if we injected something, uh, some dye intravascularly into the vessels, the dye would not go over there. It would only go into the areas where we have circumventricular organs, like here they would get a faint staining outside because there, in the periventricular organs or the circumventricular organs, we don't have that blood-brain barrier. Contrary to that, if you look into the areas where the uh, plexus is, there we find that the choroid plexus, these brush-bordered epithelial cells, are connected to each other with very dense tight junctions. They do not permit any transport from inside to outside. And that's clear, otherwise you would have an enormous increase then we would have something like an ultrafiltrate of the subjacent vessels. In order to make a possible access route for, from the vessel contents to the choroid plexus, there we loosen, where we have no tight junctions here in the vessels, so it's a fenestrated endothelial cells. So the fenestrations and intercellular gaps make it possible that these cells pick up the stuff from here and produce stuff. So basically, in these kind of areas, the blood-brain barrier is shifted from the endothelial cells, it's shifted towards the epithelial cells of the plexus. And that was proven, that's the old physiological experiment, when you inject a dye into here, then you get a nice superficial staining of the brain, of the surface, but you will not get a staining anywhere else in the body. Okay, so let's have a look at, on some periventricular uh, structures that you find here in the specimens that our colleagues from the Department of Anatomy provided. So here we have the median section. So here's the lateral ventricle. The lateral ventricle here is uh, largely invident. Seems to be an elderly patient, a little bit must look like my brain with an hydrocephalus internal evacuo, like an Alzheimer's brain. What we see here is a prominence within the lateral ventricle, the uh, head of the caudate nucleus, nucleus caudatus, and when we can see when we go down here to the borderline, here is the, here comes up the thalamus, and then when we look down here, we see something, a blue line below here, that's a thalamus striate vein, 
which is demarcating here at that area also the borderline between the telencephalic caudate nucleus and the telencephalon itself and the diencephalon meaning the thalamus. Then we go down here, here's the interthalamic adhesion. It's only a glyosyl bridge, there was nothing, there's not a commissure or something like that, it's only a glyosyl bridge. And then we have here the hypothalamic uh, sulcus. Then we proceed ventrally, we find the supraoptic recess. Yeah, here's the supraoptic recess. And here comes the infundibular recess. Here is the infundibulum or the rest of the infundibulum going down, sorry, to the hypophysial stalk. These are the areas where the supraoptic nuclei are located. And here the paraventricular nuclei giving rise uh, for the uh, hormones down to the steering the adenohypa the pituitary. So going to the back side, here's the suprapineal recess, here the pineal recess, here the um, forehill plate, then we go down here into the aqueduct, into the aqueduct, into the fourth ventricle. We do not see the apertures, but we see that we have here that close correlation between the brainstem, the cerebellum, and the roof of the fourth ventricle. So when we look on the lateral ventricle from cordally, it's the view from cordally, to the uh, anterior horn, to the posterior horn. It's always immediately visible that this must be the posterior part and this is the anterior because the posterior horns go to the lateral because further down, if you go further downhill, the ventricle has, uh, the ventricles have to circumnavigate the brainstem. So the brainstem is uh, impairing um, it. So in the frontal area, always the frontal horns are closer together than the posterior and temporal horn. So, yeah, here we can see it uh, nicely. Here the brainstem is cut away. So frontal horn, here we go to the posterior horn, is in here. Here comes the temporal horn, and it's a little bit cut down here. Yeah, I expected to see also the amygdala formation and the hippocampus area, which is followed here by the inferior horn. Here we start with the deflection. We go posteriorly, then when we turn it around here again, this choroid plexus that we can peel off here from the tania that is remaining then. If you turn it around, we see the temporal horn marching towards the front. And here comes already the hippocampal region. Hippocampus is standing in here, folding here, and this should be the nucleus subthalamicus then. Okay, so when we turn it around again, we see that uh, approaching of left and right, sorry, of left and right uh, thalamus here. here. In that case, there is also an interthalamic uh, adhesion to be seen down here. If we flip it back again, then we have all the typical structures that we know from our first year's neuroanatomy, the thalamus, the head of the nucleus, caudatus of the caudate nucleo, nucleus, which is pretty big, and the tail is that very small structure down here. That side is visible. Yeah, it's following up here. And then we have, of course, the internal capsule which is separating the striate body uh, from the thalamus with the crus anterior, the genu, and the crus posterior. So I think these are the main structures I saw. The Dr. Ravi will uh, pinpoint some other structures in his talk. So I stop here. Thank you. Thank you.